Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Vandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, in today's webinar, we're going to explore a range of issues in the run up to COP26. And we have Adam Reed, who is the Director of External Affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery. He has another role. He is the president of CIWM, who's moderating this webinar. Uh, I think those of you who attended our webinars in the past, you know that Adam has been a moderator for many other webinars in the past. Please go to the video panel section and you will find them there. Adam is, in, uh, is interviewing another Be Waste Wise moderator. We have uh, Robert Crocker, who's a writer and researcher based in South Australia. We also have Rebecca prince Ruiz. She's the executive director at Plastic Free Foundation. And we have Jürgen Jacobi, who's the international sales and who's in international sales and business development at NVAC Scandinavia. Uh, we have received your questions. We pass them on to the panelists. We also have some interesting polls. Uh, so please do use the Q&A section. Adam will ensure that all the questions get asked to the panelists as usual. So <laughs> almost all of them. So yeah, over to you, Adam. Oh, well, thank you, Sweta, and uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I, I know some of the panelists are struggling with time time zones, um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad so many of you could join us. And uh, this is a uh, this is such a, a, a hot topic, isn't it? I'm a uh, I'm five weeks away from a from a long train journey up to Glasgow in Scotland, where I can uh, I can try and uh, influence and argue and nerdle and nudge um, global politicians and leaders, business and, and public sector, to really reconsider, in my opinion, the role of resources and waste management in a decarbonised circular economy. Because if you were to read the programmes that have been shared, if you were to read the platforms that have already been announced, if you were to look at the major brands that are sponsoring, I'm struggling to see where our sector sits in this debate. And I think they've got it wrong. And so that's why we got this webinar today. That's why this panel has been put together, because I think ignoring resources is almost tantamount to failing to deliver decarbonisation. That's how big an issue I think it is. And I think I'm going to challenge my panel uh, to, to, to take on my baton and, and to give us their pitch in terms of what, what would we want to see at COP26? What can we expect from COP26? What's missing in terms of this wider decarbonisation agenda and the role of resources and waste management. It's a big topic, it's broad. We've got some very different perspectives on the panel, so I'm looking forward to hearing from them. I'll keep things flowing, but for now I'm gonna hand over. And I think I'm gonna start with Robert, Robert Crocker. How are you, Robert? Oh, very very well, thank you, Adam. <laughs> so what's, what's on your mind? I, I, I gave you this title a few weeks ago, so I know you've been thinking about it. This is, this is a topic yeah. that's close to your heart, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I'm heavily involved in the circular economy here. And uh, one of my great challenges is the business leaders here tend to see the circular economy as simply a improving recycling. There's, there's very little awareness of the scale of the problem, the, um, uh, the connection to consumption, to design, uh, to behavior, you know, and um, so there's a sort of a, an assumption that, oh, yes, we're already doing it, you know, when really the circular economy and um, the changes we need to see to decarbonize our, our economy are much more profound. And uh, you're absolutely right. Waste should be front and center. Consumption should be front and center in this agenda. Yeah. And I mean, Robert, you, you spent a lot of time in academia. You spend a lot of time thinking about these things. I mean, why is it that consumption isn't isn't on the radar? Is it because politically it's just something we shouldn't touch as a as a as a conversation, or is it is it a bigger issue than that? I think it's a bigger issue because it's much easier, in a way, to measure the results of consumption in the atmosphere, in the sea, perhaps sometimes, uh, you know, and changes in. Um, in the environment, but uh, a lot of the data that uh, you need to look at tends to be in private hands. Um, you know, or things like trade data, it's quite, quite complicated mathematically because you're looking at supply chains, um, individual companies, how they interact with their consumers. And a lot of this, they get very nervous about um, allowing people to have a look at this data. But when you look at say fast fashion or, or some of the other um, domains, plastics, um, 
the, the, the situation now is critical and completely unsustainable. You know, if we keep going um, in this way, I mean, my understanding is the economic problem is really that we become more efficient every year. We produce things uh, at lower cost. And this means ultimately lower prices and lower margins. And that pushes the producer to create more and more stuff. And you know, you 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 look at my mobile phone. The first one I owned, I think, lasted four years without a problem. Um, now you're looking at maybe a year. So that means we're making three to four times as many mobile phones per individual as we were, say, 20 years ago. You know, and um, they may be better for the environment. I don't know. Very hard to tell. I doubt it. But um, if you're making four times as many or three times as many per person, um, that uses three, presumably three to four times more energy and resources. So this is, this is the kind of uh, the challenge. And that's why um, waste needs to be considered front and center because the crisis is getting bigger and bigger all the time. And in every kind of domain, you know, whether it's clothing, whether it's uh, electronics, um, you know, even, even things like, you know, things that we think are fairly stable, like cars, people are using, you know, they're, they're better cars, they're made for, for um, to, not to break down, but their lifespans in use tend to be lower. And that's because we're training people to upgrade more frequently. And, and this, this, is, this is where the waste comes from. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you make some great points, uh, Robert. I mean, this is the whole Vance Packard 1960s book, you know, built in obsolescence. And I mean, I absolutely I think we, we, we've trained consumers to consume um, and trying to untrain them or retrain them is, is a dark art. And I'm going to get my pa other panelists to speak about that in a moment. Um, but you, you're absolutely right. You, you said it's not just increasing recycling. I'd almost argue it's absolutely nothing to do with increasing recycling no, exactly. because because too many debates I have at the moment are we can recycle it or if not, we can get more resource efficient, which is the other point you've made. Well, there comes a point where systemic revolution is the only answer to our consumption problem. And I do worry that we think, oh, we'll have another five years of recycling performance increase. Then we'll have another 10 years of, you know, resource efficiency avant garde. And yet actually we're just putting off the inevitable, which is we're still using too much resources and the population is still growing. Those two together are causing, you know, immense amounts of pain. So thank you for that. Let's flip over to Re Re Rebecca. Rebecca, how are you today? I'm really well, thank you. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to, you know, hearing your pitch on some of this. So what's What's been exercising your mind in terms of what COP should or shouldn't be doing and where the resources and, 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 um, and waste sectors sit within this decarbonisation agenda? Yeah, look, I, I think about this a lot and I think about it in terms of our footprint and what we leave behind. And just to preface that, I'd like to say to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm speaking from today. It's um, our... Indigenous first Australians here are the Wajuk uh, people of the Noongar Nation, and they are they were here for sixty thousand plus years. And through my work, I'm very um, focused on the plastics issue, um, the plastic pollution problem, the plastic waste issue that we've all come to learn so much about over the last decade, and and people are really concerned about it. And to me. It is a resource efficiency problem and it just shows the total disconnect between what we're consuming and using and, um, and, and the waste that's generated at the other end. And I do look to the time that's not so long ago, this plastic, which I think has become a symbol of this throwaway disposable society that we are, you know, it was only invented a little over 100 years ago. And when I look at what was left behind in where I live and in my country for 60,000 years, it's not very much when you consider what's been left behind. We, we've left, left behind in the last really 50 something years since we have become a throwaway disposable society. And I think that, you know, it absolute waste and our use of resources and consumption should be on this agenda because at the heart of so many of our problems, 
whether it's the plastic waste and pollution problem, whether it's this recycling and waste crisis, whether it's our linear economy, whether it's the climate emergency, whether it's our loss of biodiversity, we're using too much. You know, we're using the the resources of 1.6 planet Earth every every year. In some countries like ours, we're using probably five planets worth. And at the end of the day, if we're not ca- tackling our consumption, we're we're always going to be playing catch up. We're always it's always going to be up to the waste industry or cleanups to try and solve our way out of this issue as producers and manufacturers make more and more stuff that we don't need and we can't deal with. Very fair, very fair point indeed. I, I, a couple of uh, audience members have already started chipping in, which is great. Carry on, please. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the feed. It seems that uh, both questions and, and commentary are, are, are aligned here, which is the green agenda and, and let's be honest you know whether we're advocates for the green agenda or it's just we're aligned with the green agenda um take your pick um kind of doesn't sit comfortably with either businesses who are driven by certain kpis usually sales turnover and profit that's what their shareholders want um or necessarily with politicians um who are still very keen that the public are seen to be buying their way out of recession let's say as opposed to um, consuming less, uh, and that being about personal well-being, but that's quite a difficult thing to measure, as, as, as Robert's alluded to. I mean, uh, on those thoughts, Rebecca, I mean, do we need the politicians to bite the bullet, or, or can we get green, green business to lead from the front, or, or is it, do we need both? Oh, look, I think we absolutely need both, and what I've seen over the last 10 decade of, of doing Plastic Free July is that as individuals, as global citizens and as communities, I think that we're, that people are leading the way on this of taking personal responsibility for their consumption. You know, I think, and I think, you know, it's been that, that, um, that community action on issues like plastic bags and um, that, that seen us get plastic bag bans in place and container deposit schemes and governments commit to phase out single use plastics. And, I, you know, what I see is communities acting first and then businesses coming on board and accepting they need to take responsibility and then governments um, legislating. And I, I think we just need all, all three of those. And it's, I mean, I've, I, I've seen over the last decade a lot in, 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 the, in using the plastics issue, which I think is the kind of canary in the coal mine because it's so visual. Um, and, and it's, it is the symbol of our throwaway society. But what I've seen is um, you know, education and awareness over the last decade and now is the time for action. And it's interesting, you know, every waste strategy I've ever read, you know, talks about the waste hierarchy and the reduce, reuse, recycle and waste avoidance is our first principle. And then they get stuck straight into recycling, labelling, reducing contamination and you know, whilst p- people like you, Adam, are, are, are tasked with dealing with the multiplicity of an increasing complexity and volume of this packaging and items yep. that is, um, you know, being made by businesses, it's, it's, we're just not keeping pace with the solution. So waste avoidance and, and resource, you know, good stewardship and resource consumption has got to be at the heart of tackling all these issues. No, no, couldn't couldn't agree more. And, and, and Robert, I mean, you know, Rebecca's made some some really valid points there, and I, I, you know, they are the fundamental issues that that we are facing yeah. right now. Yeah. I mean, you must have read a few waste strategies in your time. Maybe you didn't get past the first chapter, yeah. but certainly the ones I've been reading in in the UK lately, which which you know, government led, you know, big resource revolution, and then you go straight into infrastructure, and it goes into recycling. And I, I'm, I, you know, I can't see the waste prevention. I can't see the reuse. I can't see the skills or the behavior change. That seems to be like, well, we'll deal with that later. We need to get some stuff built. And I, are we just too, too loaded with the whole, we need to build something. It needs to be visible. Is that, is that where the problem lies? I think, I think it's partly not understanding the way government and business interacts with the consumer. Because I think um, governments, in, the, in a way, if they lead this uh, properly, 
um, can use, I mean, instead of sort of looking at an ideal space in the future where everything's going to be green and everything's going to work beautifully and we're not going to have any problems, my view is it's it's an iterative process where um, you you know where you want to go, you have a clear goal, you know, and that is to reduce consumption and waste. But um, this really means shifting business models, and you can do that through a series of carrots and sticks. In South Australia, which is tiny by world standards, a million and a half people, we recently banned plastic bags, and we're now banning um, throwaway, you know, disposable plastics in, you know, eating utensils and a whole range of other things. So, I mean, it's not, it's a, it's a bit of a social experiment. Most people accept it straight away. They have no problems with it. Some of the companies in, in our sort of progress towards this uh, container deposit scheme, we started in 77, I think it was, you know, um, you know, I think we were second in the world, you know, but um, there was a lot of opposition. And, you know, we were being caned by Coca-Cola, particularly for years. You know, so, so it's not, um, uh, so my view is the problem is that politically people tend to see things in black and white. And often the solutions are collaborative, but they, they do need a clear vision of where we want to go. And at the moment, what tends to happen is people muddy that vision by getting very um, oppositional about these things and saying, well, we need a green agenda, we need this, we need that. But actually it's often, a, um, uh, you know, the circular economy, one of the beauties of it is that once you start explaining to businesses that um, it's actually quite profitable, you know, it can be quite profitable, you know, if you start shifting towards the, these standards, but you have to know where you're shifting to. And one of the problems is we, we often don't. Uh, coffee cups. Um, Rebecca, I'm sorry, I was going to send you that article. <laughs> I think about it. Um, uh, we did a study of coffee cup waste. Uh, they're absolutely ghastly things. You know, they're, they're plastic and paper. Uh, you know, there's probably five, um, I think 50 billion or something produced every year. It's ridiculous. The, the volumes are beyond, you know, nobody really, I don't think, has a clear idea of the volume because nobody's counting. But when you look at something like that, you're looking at acres of trees, you're looking at um, lakes of water, uh, all to save, what, a minute or two? I don't know, you know. <laughs> um, you know, there, there are so many other ways of delivering that service that don't necessarily damage, uh, you know, that don't, don't necessarily turn into, into uh, litter on the streets, you know. And once everybody involved in this works out another way of making money around this, it then becomes possible to move on and say, okay, well, that doesn't work. We don't need to do that. But um, my, my view is the, the politicization of this in a way is the worst strategy. You know, when you start um, making people feel that they've got choice of A or B, they often in, interpret B as starvation, going out of business, et cetera, which is not usually intended, you know, unless you're talking to some genuine communist or something. Usually, it's a, you know, uh, usually there, there's a, a solution where um, everyone can win, but they have to know uh, the damage that our economy is doing at the moment. They have to be aware of that. Yeah. Good point. I, so I, I think a few people are now commenting in the chat box, which is great. You know, uh, do we need a you know a calamity? or, you know, some form of chaos and Armageddon before we do get, you know, the, the big nations, the developed nations to kind of step up. And I thought, well, well this is a great opportunity to bring Jürgen into the conversation. Jürgen, how are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you very much, Adam. So, um, so, so what happens if the, uh, the German, the British and the American economy crash tomorrow because the circular economy isn't working? Is, is that going to be enough or do we need sea level rise, you know, so that most of our major cities are, uh, are flooded? When, when do we get to the critical tipping point that business and politicians go, yeah, OK, we're going to change? Uh, I, it's a tricky question and a good one. I think actually the, the, the tipping point will not, it won't be a catastrophic impact, I would say. And I think uh, since most of us are, are lucky or happy enough to live in a, in a democracy, we also need to accept that change in a democratic world occurs very, very slowly. Uh, everybody seems to be in favor when, once the politicians take the decisions that 
everybody thinks they are going into the right direction, but do not necessarily affect themselves right away. It's this typical not in my backyard phenomenon that unfortunately is very well um, is very well anchored in most Western countries, I would say. Uh, and getting back to you, Robert, what you said about the mobile phones here. I mean, I have, um, as anybody else, um, I have this box with really important stuff that I stack somewhere in the corner. And in my box, I have at least five mobile phones, which have been sitting there for like five years or so. Um, so I will promise you next time I go to a recycling center, I will ditch them there in the right box for the, where the other people put the electronic stuff. You know? So I will be able to sort it correctly. Um, but coming back to an issue that we touched upon this and, and regarding um, change, consumer behavioral change, I think one of the really key success factors here is creating awareness to people um, when it comes to waste avoidance, resource efficiency, which I think is that's one of my favorite subjects, but also trying to make this where the politicians come in establish a system that is relatively easy for people to use in terms of waste disposal. Uh, Sweden has this um, producer responsibility scheme, like many other countries, where we have a separate waste treatment stream for packaging. And just from, from myself, I have such a hard time explaining to my friends and family why the toothbrush is to be disposed in a different way rather than plastic packaging. And so, well, or a rubber duck or toys or whatever you want to throw away. It's the same material, more or less. It looks at least the same from a consumer perspective. But one goes into this bin and the other one goes into that bin. Maybe we are making it too complicated. Uh, I don't have the, the holy grail of waste management either in my, in my hand. So uh, I, it's easy to criticize and hard to come up with a different uh, proposal, obviously. But um, consumer awareness and one, one of my favorite examples are the e-scooters that have been flooding many, many uh, capital cities all over the world. Um, I've read some studies. I, do, I don't really have the possibility to, to double check all the numbers, but the lifetime of these scooters can be really, really short, actually less than a month in, in worst case scenarios. In Sweden, or at least in Stockholm, where I live, quite a few of them end up in the water where they definitely shouldn't belong because you have, you have the electronics, you have heavy metals and everything in there. And you don't really do something good for the environment, I would say. And, and I don't think you get people to stop using their car and use the scooter. Uh, the ones who walk or cycle use them instead. Um, and every time when I speak with people, it's the awareness that do you think about waste recycling or a waste concept for that scooter? And hardly anybody does. And I think here is, is um, a common responsibility that we all have, both as consumers, but certainly also as politicians, that you demand a waste concept when you launch new products. And uh, I think yep. one of the, the things we've seen in the pandemic, e-shopping, I mean, the amount of packages that are being sent all over the place, it's immense. And if you then think maybe one third is returned, are those goods that are returned actually being reused again or are they shredded and then incinerated? Probably depends on what type of product it is, but don't buy three different sizes and hope one fits and just buy one. <laughs> Good advice, Jürgen. And you, and you raised some really interesting points about, you know, sort of producer responsibility and where do those boundaries sit? Because you're right. I mean, you know, e-scooters, wouldn't it be simple just to have a large deposit placed on them that reflects the life cycle costs of their treatment and disposal? You get it back when you take it back to, you know, wherever you bought it from or even better. Why aren't you just leasing it from them in the first place? Um, so I think, you know, leasing models, coming back to Robert's point, that whole circular economy piece, leasing is, you know, that, that to me, different business models are going to change ownership patterns. And if the ownership patterns suddenly go from 56 million UK uh, individuals back to, you know, 56 major corporations, that's much easier to control quality, in my opinion. So, I, I, you know, we've got, to, we've got to reflect on that. You, know, you talked about narratives and you talked about language. I know both Robert and, and Rebecca have, have, have said similar. Um, you know, are, are we using the wrong language? Because... I, I when I tell people what I do for a living, they're like, oh, you're a bin man. You're right. Oh, I haven't been a bin man for 25 years, but I'm still a bin man. And it's like, oh, you work at the tip. No, I don't. I work in a nice office building. You know, no, no, I, I'm, I'm into policy and government. And no, no, you're a bin man. And um, <laughs> is circular economy really the right language? Is resource efficiency particularly sexy? Because I'm looking at it and, and it, it, here's my here's my, you know, my five pennies. And I'm going to get you to, to comment on this. 
I think we should be the, the, the industry that delivers decarbonisation, but that's not cool. So how about we're the anti-climate change delivery agency or something, some acronym around that sweater? Come up with an acronym for me by the end of the session, please. <laughs> Robert, what do you reckon? Are, are, we, are we just badging ourselves wrong? Uh, I think that's part of the problem, um, you know, and I think uh, the the idea that um, waste is totally separate from consumption is part of the problem as well. You know that uh, it's like the the two ends of a pipe. You know, we it's very easy to sort of um, uh, focus on on waste as something that you don't want because we leave it behind. We we move on. So we like to forget about it, and we've professionalized that forgetting. You know, and that. Uh, posting something away somewhere where we don't have to deal with it. And unfortunately, um, it, there's no more away, you know, as everyone knows, you know, there's no way we, we have to. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, the language is part of the problem, but also the consciousness and the, the, the idea that uh, we either, and I think the, you know, environmentally, um, you know, it's, it's terribly important to engage everyone. And that really requires a, a change in language because we, we can't go on, um, you know, in our country, we've got um, people who, who assume that if you're interested in protecting the environment, um, you know, you want to see everyone go broke, you know, you want to see, you know, these, and that's what, that's what happens when you politicize these things. But really, we're all in this together. And it's terribly important that, um, I mean, I've been working with a particular project where um, we've discovered that even people who deny climate change can be induced to change their behavior um, in and become very, very enthusiastic about um, dealing with waste properly. You know, if you can get them to adopt habits, once it's a habit, it's wonderful. Now, how do we create habits? Well, obviously, we don't create a habit by antagonizing people. Now, to create a good habit is, is really important. I mean, getting people to compost, for example, very important, uh, you know, work, uh, that kind of collaborative uh, thing. But to start with, you need to engage people to do it. You can't do that if you, you politicize that into a, a climate change issue and as being something that might lose them a job, you know, so... Uh, so I think the language is important. I think the attitudes are important. And I think, um, in a way, having a clear goal, but also realizing that it's an iterative approach that is necessarily collaborative. Because getting a big company to change its direction, to go in an area where, where it's perhaps never been before, is very risky. And, uh, you know, so this, this, is one, this is, to me, the fundamental problem with the circular economy is we need new business models, we need new design, and we need to engage consumers. And those three areas tend to be the neglected areas. We're, we're very happy to get into recycling because yeah. that becomes your problem, Adam. <laughs> Thanks. Is, is, I mean, that, that's a really interesting area. I mean, is there a role for government in helping to underpin some of that new business model development and, and to almost do some of the early testing with consumers because it's in our interests, whether it be UK PLC or the European Union or Australia or whoever it might be. You know, I'm, I'm not sure every business is going to take that risk because some of them are going to fail and that business will be, will, will, you know, will, will cease absolutely. to exist. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think uh, it is the fundamental role of government in this space to um, help develop, uh, you know, and to help shoulder the risk you know, we, we um, developed, one of our government agencies here developed a very interesting database for designers of packaging called PrEP. And it's basically like a, um, a, a checklist. You know, if you design a packaging like this, there's a red code, it's going to cause problems. You know, <laughs> don't do it. You know, <laughs> and it's surprising how many uh, companies are taking this on. My own view is that we should be doing this in every sector, not just in, in packaging, packaging plastics, for example. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, there, there are so many uh, terrible plastics out there. We shouldn't be producing them, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I, lots of commentary coming back about polit politicians. Sorry, just hang on you. Lots of politics coming up. There's debates about how strong is the green movement. You know, we should be voting for, for people to make decisions who understand the environmental agenda more. I mean... Do we really believe that Greta and the 
and the movement that has you know gone across the planet in these last two or three years is going to be sufficient so that when my son is a voting age we're going to see a sea change to green i mean how do we feel about it or, or can we afford to wait that long um Jürgen, you're up first yeah i think that's the, that's actually the, the key question to ask here and i fully agree with what robert just said um, the question is where do we get the timeline in how quick do we need to move and um me living in Sweden, I'd say the, uh, Sweden as a country has in general a relatively good waste management system in general. There, there are lots of edges here and there, but compared to uh, um, a poorer country, we're, we're doing quite well. And which is, does it make sense to take a lot of Swedish tax money to twiggle out the last percentages? Or should we take half the tax money and get some landfills organized in poorer countries so that we can avoid illegal okay. landfills, for example, to reduce methane and CO2 emissions from those. Politically, very difficult, I believe. Probably impossible to get that through. But from the climate perspective, it would have a much higher impact, I would guess. So that kind of shows the, the, the complexity of the world we're living in. And I'm not saying we should neglect waste management in Sweden. Please don't get me wrong, anybody here. Now. So that's, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah? Uh, but I want to illustrate how tricky it is and where do you gain the big percentages? Maybe not in Sweden, maybe not in South Australia, if that's where Robert is placed, I believe. Huh? I, 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 you raise a really interesting point there, Jürgen, and I, and I think it's it, something like COP is where that kind of discussion should be happening. Because it's, is it right that every country sets some very similar targets to go from wherever they are? to 70% reduction or 50% reduction or, or, you know, whatever, net zero, whatever that means. Or actually, should we be saying, you know, the Western world in particular, some of these countries that have got very high recycling and very low, you know, residual waste, let's call it, could be putting infrastructure and investment into countries where at the moment, as, as one of the um, audience members has written, you know, millions of people not getting a collection of waste, open burning in the street, that, that, that is collected, open burning at a dump site, how much methane is going up in, in you know, uh, the urban zones of, of, of Latin America, Africa and Asia that we just don't have any idea about the scale of? Yes. Surely more investment into that space would make more sense. And that's what COP's role might be. Rebecca, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think it's an interesting... I think it's an interesting concept. I would love to see that happen. Um, I don't quite know <laughs> that the framework that would that that um, could see that kind of reform being delivered. So you had the equity on a global scale. Um, I'd like to just bring in the a bit of a discussion on food waste. Um, you know, food waste is um, you know whilst you know in in um, in developed countries we have you know increasingly collections of organics and um less plans for less food waste to end up in in landfill when you actually look at you know where food waste is 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 being produced like we would have you know i think in australia and the us it's 40 percent of all the food that's grown is wasted and in our country in these countries a lot of it is happening at the household Level, whereas in developing countries, that happens more at the production, at the production scale. So food waste is just such a big issue that I don't know that um, I know I'm not a food waste expert, but any anyone's getting this, um, doing particularly well on 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 this issue. And I think I've read a stat or something like if food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest greenhouse gas emitter behind you know the US and. And China, and and whilst we might have great waste management systems for it, or better waste management systems for it in developing countries, we're actually producing more of a problem here. So I still think that whilst um, there, there's definitely a need to support developing countries, I think there's a lot of aspects of our of our waste that we're not getting right either. That. No. that we need to pay attention to. I, I, I think you make a really valid point there, Rebecca, because actually, if you think about it, the food waste agenda, if it's the third biggest, you know, emitter, you know, if you look, if you consider it as a country, um, it doesn't have its own special feature at COP. It seems to me 
again, it's somewhere else in the system and it, it's not drawing attention to what is a really big issue, which is either you're buying more than you need, you're not handling it correctly at home, i.e. you're not storing it properly, or the farming system that's producing it is inefficient. And, and where do we put the intervention? If you put the intervention into farming, you reduce food waste and reduce carbon. It's got nothing to do with waste management. And actually, it might have nothing to do with consumers. But it's all about where do you make the interventions, which comes back to Jürgen's point. Do you put the intervention into Latin America or do you put the interventions into South Australia and, and, and Sweden? Good question. Right, I, I want to open it up to, uh, to the audience a little bit. We've got a couple of poll questions just to break things up. Let my uh, panellists grab a, grab a juice. Sweater, can we launch number one? Now, I'm assuming the answer to this is going to be quite com quite compelling because this is an audience of experts that, have d that found the, the, uh, the webinar and decided it was right for them. So... Are you aware of the environment impact of your consumption? I'm not asking for you to tell me what it is in, in tons of uh, you know, carbon, but are you conscious of the, of the environmental impact associated with your consumption patterns? It's yes, I'm very aware. Yeah, I know a bit. And no, I'm not aware. Be honest, because we can't track who said what. But you know, this is going to give my panel something to think about. Um, we give them 30 seconds, Sweater. And while we do, Jürgen, Robert, Rebecca, you're clearly very aware because you, you live and breathe the sector, but would you honestly put your hand up and say, I'm very aware, Jürgen? I would actually go for, I know a little, I think about it, but I don't know enough about it, I'd say. Okay, Rebecca? I would say I'm very aware in waste, but less aware in terms of uh, the carbon impacts. Okay, and, and, and Robert, are you making conscious decisions on a daily basis because you're aware? Um, I'm probably uh, a little aware, but that's simply because I think uh, most people today are, uh, know less about what's in the box that they're taking home than anyone ever in the world in the historical uh, recent, you know, hundreds of years, in fact. You know, we are, we are completely, um, the lack of transparency in in the economic system is so profound that you can't really expect people to know very much. And for me, one of the agendas that needs to change is transparency. You know, we, we really have a problem uh, in terms of consumption in that, you know, even, even designers don't know what where a lot of this comes from in this, you know. It's <laughs> so so we, we got strong feedback there. Thank you, Sweater. 70% very aware, 28% I know a little. So let, let's switch that question now. Thank you, audience, for, for panelists for being so honest as well, by the way, because you're right, it's hard to make the right decision every time because even if you know a little, you don't always know how to act on that because the system or the structure doesn't now enable you to. So, Sweater, let's ask the next question for the audience. Sorry, sorry Adam, out of curiosity, where would you put yourself on those? Uh, I, I know a lot, <laughs> but I don't always act on it because it's hard to. So... Yeah, it's a tough gig. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to upset anybody. It's a tough gig. Sweater, next question. Audience. So now think about this in terms of your customers or your suppliers, people in your value chain, however you want to take this question. But this is not you. This is people that you interact with, the people that you're working with or working for. How aware are they of the environmental impact of their consumption patterns? Okay, so it's a simple question. It's very aware. They know a little or not aware. Now, Robert, we're assuming there's going to be a bit of a difference now between those that were dedicated enough to dial into a webinar at whatever time it is in the time zone that they're currently in, compared to the people that they might work for, who are probably expecting the experts on this call to, um, to be able to sort their problems out for them. So I'm assuming this number is going to drop a little bit. I mean, is that your expectation? I'm not, I'm not sure, because I think um, uh, it's terribly, terribly hard to be accurate in uh, any particular area, you know, because of the complexity of supply chains, etc. So, you know, I think, um, you know, you know, I, I'm often surprised by even talking to people in industry who don't fully know where the stuff they're making comes from, let alone, you know, uh, so it's, so in a way, what we have to be aware of is that a lot of people would like to know, and end up knowing something about something, but that is not necessarily enough. That's the problem, I guess. That's okay. why I would like to see transparency on the agenda. Tra tra I think transparency is a great takeaway message. And, and, and whilst uh, Sweater puts up the answer, thank you all the chat that's coming in the chat function because there's some brilliant examples, some lovely statistics in there. Community, use it, learn from it. 
you know, share by all means. Ah, oh, here we go. This is far more interesting. Now, look, they, the audience think only 6% are very aware, 58% know a bit. And that's why they're talking to people like us. But as high as 30%, 37% are not aware at all. That's, um, that's quite sobering. Rebecca, I mean, were you expecting such a stark change? Um, look, to be honest, I don't think I could fall. <laughs> I, I didn't have an idea because I'm not sure of who's on the call and what their what their organisations are, who their customers and suppliers are. Um, it, I, I mean, yes, it's probably would be higher than I, I would have hazarded a guess at. I know from, I mean, this is just talking about plastics here, but we know from our general public research for Plastic Free July that 90% of the general public say they're concerned about their waste uh, plastic waste going to landfill and ending up in the environment and they aren't okay with it and they want to make a difference so our consumers and, and um, customers at Plastic Free July they are very aware of the issue and they want to do something but as we know that's not always easy. Thank you. Loads of questions. Oh you're going to go on. I was surprised to see it uh, swing to the other side of, of the answers. I, I would, ex would have expected the absolute maximum to be in the middle. I'm surprised that 37% said not aware. That's, um, yeah, I, I found that surprising. I didn't expect that one. As I said, very sobering from my perspective. Right, loads of good comments coming in. I mean, we're, we're, we're exploding into life now. So you've, you've certainly stirred the, uh, <laughs> stirred the pot. Thank you, the three of you. Um, I, I want to focus on, a question that I think COP really does need to address, which is <clears throat> where our sector sits or doesn't sit when it comes to targets, uh, it comes to funding, uh, it comes to transparency and visibility in the, in the market. So IPPC focuses on a sector by sector basis and waste management is end of pipe. So, you know, we contribute to green estimate missions, but we're, we're not as big as you know, transport or, or even, you know, buildings uh, through heating and, and, and things like that. Now, we need to change that narrative somehow, because if, you know, we help put a recycled fuel into transport sector and significantly reduce their emissions, the transport sector gets the benefit. It gets the, it gets the pat on the back. It gets the, the tick in the box. It gets the green, the green star. Mm -hmm. um, and if reduction in, you know, think about food waste, if, if we help make the food, way, uh, food production system more efficient. And then we, you know, compost more of it to create nutrients that go back into the soil production system. Then the agricultural sector gets a pat on the back and said, well done, and aren't you great on the journey? Again, we get no mention in, in dispatches. Where, how, how, do we, how do we get a more holistic discussion so that those sectors are being targeted in a way that we're part of that analysis or part of that, that journey? Because if we're not, they knock on our door and go, oh, we need a new X or can you give me recycled Y without any understanding of what we do or don't do. And, and that, that value chain just doesn't work. You, you need us to go on the journey together so we know what they're trying to achieve and we can then help either fuel it or provide the materials or help them redesign what they do so it doesn't produce a waste in the first place. I mean, what are you thinking, Robert? I mean, that's got to be the question for COP, hasn't it? Absolutely. And I think um, uh, there was a comment by uh, David Robertson. No, Robertson. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, which was really to that point that, you know, they're, they're, they measure sectors, but in a way consumption and waste tend to fall, um, you know, across sectors and, uh, you know, just as supply chains do. And you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, waste, um, you know, is what we leave behind. So it's tied to time to a great extent. And this is another dimension that we need to think about because if um, things are going to last for shorter periods, if we're going to encourage people to upgrade more quickly, if we, uh, you know, in an accelerated lifestyle, even if you're buying lots of good green things, green products, and you're, um, you're, you're upgrading, to something better, your, your footprint is still li liable to be as big as somebody who sticks with the gas guts or in the, you know, the thing that doesn't, <laughs> the bad habits, you know. So, so in a way, uh, that's why, you know, the solution has to be collaborative and intersectorial. We, we need to actually look at solutions that 
um, you know, and that's why things like leasing works, you know, to a great extent or can work. You mentioned that. That's why, uh, you know, in terms of food waste, getting um, uh, systemic change is, is the way to, way to approach this. And I think in, in I think we'll find in, um, in clothing, it'll be the same problem, you know, ultimately, you know, the same solution. We'll, we'll need a systemic change. Now, it's very nice if one company puts QR codes, you know, in their clothes and uh, tells the customers how to recycle properly. But unless you have some way of making the producers more responsible and governments acting uh, to do that, you know, what I'm concerned about, I think, most of all, is getting consumers agitated and feeling that they are themselves responsible and then... Uh, individuals saying, well, I'm greener than you because I'm doing the right thing. You know, that doesn't really make much difference at a global scale. You know, the point Jürgen was making about the internationalization of this, it's, it's uh, the scale of these issues are so great. You know, I mean, just taking textiles, it's the, the scale of textile production is so vast. Um, if we keep going in this direction it's going to swallow up more and more of our <laughs> of our resources our water etc you know we, we can't we can't sort of rely on individual companies i think you know and and this again brings us back to government and the role of government and policy which um you know you're you're fully aware of adam so <laughs> so, so is the is the real answer here about externalities and how we capture the true costs whether it be the production of cotton or the inability to recycle the e-scooter, um, you know, do we somehow need to put that true price into, you know, if you want to buy a pair of jeans and it costs you 150 pounds because that's the cost of a pair of jeans because of the water that's been used and, you know, in, 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 in the cotton manufacturer, then maybe that's going to change people's perspectives on how you look after jeans. You might then go for a leasing model or a, or a jeans for life model that grows and shrinks with you as you go and, you know, you, you, you'd send them back and get a new pair. I'm wondering, you know, a lot of the audience have been flagging externalities as a, or, or, or variations. I think, Rebecca, is, is externalities the, the next game changer then here? I mean, you know, we've got EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. That's partly trying to reflect the externalities for packaging, but we probably need to go faster and, and larger, don't we? Because I don't think they fully covered the true externalities of our production system. Yeah, it's, a, um, it's an interesting point. I think... I think it, we, we do need to factor in the externalities. And what I keep, keep coming back to thinking about in this conversation is that, is that you know, what, what we've got by looking at it in a sector by sector basis, it's very siloed thinking and it's disconnects, you know, it's disconnecting the waste from our transport, it's, et cetera. And, I, I think we should actually be thinking of it as a circular economy. And if we looked at it from a circular economy perspective, I think then everything, you know, then our transport, then our waste production and the design and production, the product stewardship, everything can fall into that kind of a framework. Um, I think the, the current, the current system, I feel like we're just, again, going back to what I said before, we're just always playing catch up with these externalities. And there is a cost to, to the waste that's being produced, but it's in our current linear system, it's just completely the, the people and the sector, the industry, the waste industry that's dealing with it is completely disconnected from the choices that the producers and the manufacturers are, are, are paying for it. So... We've got to start to bring in all parts of this jigsaw and the puzzle together in order to tackle it in a holistic way. Otherwise, we're just going to still be looking at it in a very siloed approach. And as you start to tweak one issue, then you're creating an issue somewhere else, Unin like the e-scooters. Un unintended consequences then flow. Um, Jürgen, I, I, I'm... I'm, I'm still worried about my five weeks from now, I turn up at COP and I'm trying to get my, my voice heard. And apart from, you know, taking radical action and, and, and putting a sandwich board on and some placards, which, which may get me some TV news coverage and, and probably a, a night in the jail cells. 
um, what can we do to, to put what clearly, you know, the audience are bought into this, that our sector embedded in other sectors who are on a huge transition. How do we ensure that the politicians and the big brands get it sooner rather than later? Because we can't change this from our perspective on our own. We need, you know, Rebecca's right. We need them to come with us. Mm -hmm. We almost need them to want it because then we've got a reason to support them. It's, it, it's a very difficult question to answer. And I, I fully agree with what uh, Robert and Rebecca just said earlier. Uh, it, it comes down to transparency and again, creating awareness. And I think Adam, coming back to the, the Greta Thunberg movement, I think that is actually one of the biggest uh, awareness creators we have seen for the past decades. Uh, and there is no simple solution. There is no quick fix and there's not no one, one size fits all. And here we've only been speaking about domestic waste. Let's not get into industrial waste and industrial plastics and everything, because then, then we're, whoa, we're way off. Well, so <laughs> we have a lot of issues to tackle for sure. Coming back to COP, I do believe that politicians need to set the framework in which we need to act. Again, there, that framework, even within the European Union, uh, is, will be different from one country to another country. I saw one of the comments here, someone said, well, please don't put la landfills as the bad boy, because that's the first step of waste management in some countries. Fully right. But let's try to get rid of illegal landfills, at least. The well-managed ones are really a good way of starting a waste management system. So my, my, my hope for the COP meeting is really that, that waste gets higher on the again, agenda, because it is part of the circularity. And it's actually, um, it has to be a... a the underlying baseline for what is being discussed on the on the circularity is what how to avoid the stuff that cannot be recycled. Okay, well, I've got one more panel question. Uh, one more um, audience poll question. Can we go to number four, Sweater? Let's do the uh, fast fashion because I know this is Robert's pet topic right now. So we've we've heard about you know lots of stakeholders involved. So let let, let audience here we go have a pick. Who is responsible? We can only pick one. So you, know, you can't hedge your bets. It's not collaborative action. We know the answer is collaborative action. Who is responsible for driving change in fast fashion? Because some of Robert's numbers earlier are quite scary, aren't they? Um, is it government? Because Jürgen said they set the framework, they set the rules. Is it the brands? Because ultimately, they're the ones that are making the decisions. Is it the waste industry? Because we're the ones picking up the problem. Or is it consumers? Because, well, it all starts with consumers. Take your pick. Um, I'll let Robert come back in a moment on this one. I'm just conscious we've got a few minutes left, so get ready with your uh, closing comments. Um, but um, I, I, there's some brilliant questions coming in. Um, and a lot of people wanting to know what, what's the answer if we go beyond recycling. And I think we've talked about circular economy. We've talked about reuse. We've talked about repair, remanufacturing. There are so many things that go above recycling, in my opinion. But waste prevention has to be you know, paramount. So all of those of you working in in you know odd locations around the world, um, you know think about how can you get your system to be just more efficient and, and less waste uh, pro productive. Right here we go. What do we got? Thirty three percent government, thirty eight percent brands. Thank God it wasn't the waste industry. Well done everybody. Four percent and twenty five percent consumers. Robert, this is your question. I mean, is that what you expected? And is that is that a fair reflection? Do you think somewhere between government and brands? I think it's pretty good, actually. Um, you know, it, it does reflect really the collaborative nature of the problem. Um, you know, it, it's surprising to me um, to keep coming up against reports where some of the manufacturers aren't quite sure where their cotton comes from, or and a lot of people aren't really aware of the amount of plastics in, um, in you know, in in a lot of textiles now, and and that again. Uh, in a way links um, what Rebecca's doing to this problem as well. You know, that we're talking about um, materials that uh, there, there's basically, the cycle is too fast. You know, that if, if you look at it from a circular economy point of view, whatever you do, you're going to have to slow the cycle down because if we keep uh, the, the, the textile industry going at the, the speed it's going at at the moment, there's no cure, there's no end. It's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. We can recycle more, we can incinerate more, we can manage the waste more carefully, um, and, but still the, the, the speed is too great, which in a way um, forces us to consider the circular economy in a more holistic way, uh, which to me is very important. That 
that again involves design, involves consumption, and involves business models. Those three, those three things are to me um, should be priorities in this space, and probably also in food waste, actually. Re yeah. Rebecca. Um, yeah, look, I, th I think Robert made some, made some really good points there that it is it is a shared responsibility and like everything, um, you know, it's going to take all of us to um, it's going to take all of us to, to to get the solutions. And I do think that that there is a great need as there is in all our issues to have that community and citizen awareness, education, and large-scale behaviour change, because I think that's where we see the call for the call for action. And at the end of the day, we're the ones that are that are buying it and and using it. So I think that um, yeah, individual responsibility has got to be part of that. The answer there. Thank you. Right. I'm conscious of time. Let's um, let's go down the panel and get them to give me a takeaway message or a hashtag soundbite, something we can put on social media later and everybody goes, wow, we missed an unbelievable session. We must watch that back later. Jürgen, you're up first. Um, my catchphrase will be don't buy products with double packaging. If something is packed in, in paper and it has a plastic wrapping around it, don't buy it. Power of consumers. The power of consumers. I like that. You deflected that, but we'll take it. Uh, Rebecca. I'm going to use the Plastic Free July tagline, which is choose to refuse. Okay, we're back. Consumers are getting, get, get. It's, it's all in the, in the hands of the consumer here. Come on, Robert. It's not all about consumers only, is it? It's producers as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, are, they are ultimately, um, they have to be the leaders in this with government, you know, and that's why you need to be in COP, Adam. So, Adam, oh, for COP. I haven't forgot. I'll, 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 I'll take your uh, I'll take your baton and I will run with it to, to Glasgow over the next five weeks. Thank you very much, panel. You've been... I can't even get out of my state, so I'm very happy. Well, well, they might not let me into Scotland. There's all sorts of rules and regulations here in the UK. But no, um, thank you, panel, for your, your input today. Fabulous. Always good to get a global perspective. We've covered a, a lot of territory. Um, probably haven't covered as much territory as the audience would have liked, but the chat the buzz that's going on. I, I think we've connected about a hundred different people today. So, you know, they're going to go away with some new friends and some new, new expertise. So hopefully that uh, they'll, they'll come back for some more. Um, it's been a pleasure hosting us. Of course, I, I, you know, a, a good audience and a good panel makes my life easy. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to Sweater who will uh, wrap things up for us. Sweater, how are you? Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jürgen, Robert and Rebecca. And thanks a lot to the audience. You're still going with the messages out here. So I really hope you can connect with each other. And uh, if you would like anyone's contact, please drop us an email at connect at wastewise.be. This is just a reminder to the audience. We have another webinar on Thursday. Emma Burlow is moderating the webinar. So please head to our website and you can register for it. And uh, thanks a lot to the panelists. Bye-bye. Have a good day and a good evening to Rebecca and Robert. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye.